So welcome everyone uh, to this uh, webinar called Strengthening Technical Assistance to Deliver the Renovation Wave. My name is Monica Frassoni. I am the president of the European Alliance to Save Energy, which is a multi-stakeholder business-led organization, which since uh, more or less 10 years uh, tries together with uh, many partners uh, and led by our business representative um, to um, try really to strive the case of energy efficiency as one of the uh, key um, elements for our energy and in general economic transformation, um, not only in view of the climate uh, change, but also of the need of finding new business models, a new way of consuming, consuming a new way basically of staying in our planet. And we believe that uh, the reduction of the consumption of energy through uh, technological developments and through solution is the best way uh, to uh, deal with these issues. And today we talk about a question that uh, is probably not one that makes, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, first pages on all newspapers, but that uh, we have found over the last uh, years to be very important for actually allowing the implementation of this very difficult challenge uh, that uh, we are uh, facing, uh, facing today. So the lack of technical support uh, and inadequate administrative capacity, notably at national, but also at, uh, at um, local and regional level, have been spotted as among the most important barriers to, uh, in particular, we are talking today about building renovation and in general energy efficiency uh, problems in EU member states. The European Commission and in general the European Union is aware of this and therefore there are instruments that are at the disposal of member states uh, in order to improve uh, the um, possibility of having um, a technical assistance done, as I said, at the level that is most uh, that is most needed. So what we try to do this morning, and I thank very much the um, speakers from our own members, but also um, from a representative from the Commission, <laughs> the Italian and the Spanish government that are here with us. Um, we, what we're trying to today is to discuss uh, how to strengthen the tech technical assistance in phase, in, 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 um, in view of a successful uh, renovation, uh, renovation way, which we, as you know, we consider to be a great project, not only because it, uh, it, uh, it allows um, everything that is uh, behind um, buildings to be put uh, into a major also communication tool. And uh, we see that also the artistic and architectural side, the Bauhaus as is slowly taking off. Um, and, uh, uh, and indeed, in order to make sure that this renovation way happens, it has to be seen and to happen indeed on the ground. And the credibility of this great idea, it's very much at stake if people really don't own it and this member state don't uh, really uh, implement it. So um, indeed, technical assistance and administrative logistical capacity seem to be very technical issues, but we decided today to discuss uh, about them and to see whether uh, our speakers can lead us uh, in, uh, in bringing not only solutions, but also some ideas and some connections, uh, some synergies really, uh, in order to make this agenda more present, more used also uh, at, the, at all the um, levels possible. So uh, we start with our first panel and the first panel is um, we put the title cohesion policies and technical assistance. And uh, I am, uh, well, yes, there are some practical information that uh, you see here that are always useful. So it is always possible to ask questions, but please use a Q&A tool. I will look at it. And uh, uh, when uh, there are uh, questions, I will try to put them to our speakers. And uh, please also specify to whom you want to direct uh, uh, to want to direct your your question. As as you probably noticed, the um, the seminar is uh, the webinar. Sorry, is uh, recorded. So um, if you don't like it to be recorded, then you just have to leave us. Okay. So thank you uh, very much. So I will uh, just. Um, uh, you have seen our 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 speakers on the. Uh, 
uh, on the on the um, uh, on the screen. But I will start by giving the floor to Nicola De Michelis, uh, who is director for Smart and Sustainable Growth and Program Implementation as DG Regio European Commission. Uh, we have been working quite a lot with uh, and quite well actually with uh, Mr. De Michelis in the former occasions, and I'm very glad to see him here. Um, and uh, basically, I would like uh, him to tell us um, what is his take, since he is really working hands-on on implementation um, of, uh, of this issue of technical assistance um, in order, really from his, from his viewpoint, and if cohesion policy uh, does promote uh, the uh, actual use of technical assistance. Nicola, you have the floor. Yes, Monica, thank you. Um, and thanks to, uh, to all. Um, well, building, building uh, renovation is one of the sectors facing the biggest uh, uh, investment or the largest investment gap. I think that the commission oh. has estimated at around 275 billion euro per year, the, uh, the needs in additional investment. And, uh, and cohesion policy has contributed in the period that is closing around 14 billion euros, which compared to the 275 per year is not gigantic, but it's still a pretty hefty uh, amount of, uh, of money. And I'm pretty sure that in the programming period that is opening, and we are now in the process of negotiating the new programs, the new strategies, uh, these amounts will increase simply because uh, the, the world has changed. We have a green deal that will largely inform uh, the, uh, the negotiations of the new programs. And yet, progress, progress in this area has been disappointing. And even when there is funding, um, whether the shortage of information and low awareness at the lower level, because of variation in terms of availability of information, because of cumbersome regulatory procedure uh, uh, to access public finance, the use of these resources is, is, is limited. And furthermore, demand for uh, renovation in the residential sectors in particular needs to be fostered and promoted rather than taken for granted uh, so that this will require uh, proactive, proactive encouragement. And what we have um, detected over the past few years is there is one area in which member states, regions, local governments face difficulties is precisely this one. And uh, just as an example, the, the reprogramming that took place last year to face the COVID crisis moved resources away from these areas because they were facing implementing, implementing problems toward uh, priorities that we all agree were priorities and are still probably are, but they, they, they indicate that there is, there is an issue. And so, yes, the answer to your question is technical assistance is very much needed. Um, what we call capacity building or administrative capacity building. It's clear that doing nothing is not an option and expecting a sort of a natural improvement of capacity um, is, is, not, is not a way to go and will take in any way much too long. Um, I, 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 I will stop uh, just by saying that, however, in, in constructing and thinking about uh, technical assistance, we need to be sure that we construct instruments that are, that are covering the different aspects of what is needed. And this means that you need to think about how to construct a project pipeline. You need to think about to increase the capacity in public bodies, in the private sectors, but in the beneficiaries that are the ones that at the end, in the end, implement the policy. You need to think about the financing and the public and private and how to construct financing instruments. You need to think about the enabling framework, uh, the, the regulation and the rules, the partnership on how to involve the stakeholders to make, to raise awareness and create the demand that is largely lacking. So we need just to be careful not to have a single single uh, purpose uh, instrument, but look at the at the overall at the overall picture. And uh, Nicola, just a very quick uh, question, and then we will uh, because 
the, the idea here is that we pass from one speaker to the other, but I just wanted to ask you, and is this happening? What you just described as needed? Well, yeah. Look, I, I think that if, if anything, there is, uh, there is um, a fragmentation of, uh, of technical assistance tools. Um, in the field of cohesion policy, we have uh, the normal technical assistance that is available, and we're talking about billions of euros that is available to member state to, uh, to, to set up these uh, this, this supporting instruments. We are now in the process of uh, negotiating and, and finalizing with the World Bank uh, a, a renovation wave technical assistance support for a number of, of member states. There is uh, uh, Jaspers, you know, the, the, the instrument that we have set up with the, with, the, with the EIB. There is the new technical support instruments that has now, I think uh, this will be discussed later on, has, has uh, devised a, a specific support for building renovation. There is Elena, there is Horizon 2020, there, there's plenty. There is the Invest EU Advisory Hub. Uh, now, the question I suspect is rather how to ensure that the user and the uh, is able to to understand where 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 to where to look at and what and what to uh, and what to what instrument fits better the 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 needs on the ground, but I don't think that there is a lack of uh, of, uh, of of tools at this point in time. Thank you very much. So the issue is more the coordination, and so we go to one member state then. Um, so uh, Christina uh, Reberger is the Deputy Director and Programming and Evaluation of European Fund in the Minister of Finance Spain. So I think that uh, she's exactly the right person we need to uh, follow up on what Nicola just uh, explained. And um, Spanish cohesion program and investment, actually Spain is not the only one, but uh, um, in energy efficiency, were often delayed in the past or redirected to other objectives and probably also the lack of technical assistance um, and administrative capacity was one of the reasons for this. Um, so I would like to know, given the potential of energy efficiency for, uh, for your country in all aspects, but certainly in the building ones, uh, what uh, is the Spanish government doing in this respect? Is there a consciousness that this is an issue? Um, are there instruments? How do you manage the um, diversity of tools that Nicola just uh, referred to. Christina, over to you. And thank you for okay. being here. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this panel. Um, for us, for me, and, and I guess for all the colleagues uh, present today, it is always um, interesting and enriching to, to exchange views and best practices with uh, European colleagues and, and particularly on topics as interesting as this one. No? Mm, answering your question uh, first, um, I agree. I mean, we're, we're um, a great example of what has been said here by you and by Nicola. Spain has uh, experienced a problem of implementation with those um, that part of the European uh, structural funds uh, historically. And I would like to uh, explain today um, where do I think our problems are. Uh, because um, I think that um, Spain, in fact, is, is currently in, in a sweet spot regarding this topic. We are enjoying a rather rare combination of public awareness, political consensus, industrial and technological preparedness. And now with the recovery plan, we have the uh, this um, unprecedented financial uh, resources to support climate and environmental action. Mm. I mean, in the, the recovery package has come as a unique opportunity uh, to further efforts towards achieving climate neutrality. Um, but it is true that our recovery plan builds on years of climate and environmental action, counting on the support of structural funds. And the idea is that structural funds will assure continuity uh, of efforts throughout 21-27. As Nicola said, um, it is expected that cohesion policy will support, uh, will, be, will, will target uh, those aspects 
in a more consistent manner than uh, other periods, and, and that will be the case for Spain as well. Um, so our, our programming period, in this programming period, uh, our initiatives will be further concentrated around climate and environmental objectives, for sure. Um, uh, concerning our policies, I uh, have to say that uh, already for quite some years, um, the aim has been to define the adequate environment that enables uh, the shift towards climate, towards a climate neutrality or towards a climate, climate neutral economy. Sorry, um, and this has required to put in place ambitious long-term strategies. A clear regulatory framework and, and properly dimensioned, properly designed incentives. Um, we have uh, as, as our main roadmap the Spain's Integrated National Energy and Climate Plan, um, which uh, in fact establishes very, very ambitious objectives, very, very ambitious commitments with climate in our country. Um, I mean, we, and, and those commitments have been, uh, have became binding um, because we, uh, they were put into law by the Climate Change Act last May. And as regards um, energy efficiency, I have to say that uh, we, um, we are committed to reach uh, 39.5% improvement in energy efficiency, which is, uh, as I said, very ambitious. And it is more ambitious, in fact, that, than, than required by the Energy Efficiency Directive, which is 32.5%. Uh, that was the minimum benchmark established by the directive. Um, and within the framework of the Integrated National Energy and Climate Plan that, I, that I've just described, um, we have the long-term strategy for energy uh, retrofitting in the building sector in Spain, uh, which is uh, also the, 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 the long-term strategy towards modernizing existing buildings to make them more energy efficient. Uh, and we have put in place in this context uh, similar uh, measures, similar typology of measures at, as other member states, such as financial and fiscal measures, for example, support programs for retrofitting, tax allowances, and of course, regulatory measures. But, um, but however, and, and, and despite all these, the statistics uh, show that uh, retrofitting in Spain has been uh, much lower, has been growing um, 3% per year, more or less, since 2017. But this is much lower than the Commission recommended 3%. And uh, as a result, Spain lags behind other member states in uh, renovation rates. Mm why why i'll try to answer these um i have to take into account that our country uh, comes from a long tradition of uh, new builds that fueled the spanish economy for years uh, or even decades in the early 2000s spain alone built more homes than germany france and italy combined and in the meantime, the big housing developments of the 60s and 70s have remained substandards, substandard, sorry, in, in terms of efficiency and materials uh, used. Mm, more than 80% mm, of our country's building stock heavily consumes energy. And uh, we have a large proportion of properties lacking proper insulation and susceptible, of course, to an energy uh, retrofitting that could bring sizable energy savings. Mm. Um, financial needs to modernize Spain's buildings uh, in the run-up to 2030 have been estimated at over 40 uh, billion. Uh, and on the side of the public sector, a lot can be uh, made and, and, in fact, is being made. Uh, we are uh, renovating, rehabilitating public buildings, hospitals, schools, social housing. But as regards individuals, the situation is not the same. And um, among the complexities that um, hinder uh, energy retrofitting and renovation, renovations, 
I, I, I guess that uh, one of the most important are, uh, first of all, the involvement of different levels of administration. This, is, um, this um, entails a big uh, administrative complexity. Uh, as you know, our system is very complex uh, as this respect, and we, um, it is what it is. It, it, it has no an easy uh, solution, um, but we can tackle it with uh, administrative, with uh, technical assistance, of course. And I will talk about uh, that uh, after. Um, another problem is uh, the the prevailing type of multifamily housing. Uh, that we have in Spain. Um, this implies uh, high difficulties in the decision-making process. And um, uh, this is very important because uh, Spain is, uh, this is a, a, a particularity of Spain compared to other member states. We have no uh, individual dwellings uh, in urban areas uh, as other countries have in Spain, in Madrid, in Barcelona, in the big cities, mm, the core uh, are uh, multifamily housing uh, buildings, uh, tower buildings of uh, residences, of homes. And uh, this, of course, complicates our all the process, all the decision making process mm, when one has to uh, uh, take, take, I mean, um, go ahead with one uh, rehabilitation or renovation um, project. And <clears throat> another problem uh, is or, or has been uh, the, I said before, I started saying before, or maybe I think that the, the panel didn't, ha hadn't started at that moment, but I've said that uh, today is a sunny day in Madrid and uh, this is um, this is great, but this mild weather, uh, in fact, um, makes that um, the, the the homeowners and uh, individuals have um, at the end of the day less incentives to look for this uh, this uh, renovation or rehabilitation or energy efficiency projects. Uh, I mean, there is a social awareness, I said before, but um, at the end of the day, incentives, uh, real incentives, are not still there. And we have, uh, uh, moreover, a tariff structure of energy with a high share of fixed costs over the variable costs associated with consumption. So smaller savings are uh, arise uh, um, thanks to energy efficiency projects. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, it is uh, subsidies, uh, I mean, subsidies support programs are key to provide individuals with the necessary incentives to carry out those uh, works. But we need to go far beyond financing. I agree totally with uh, Monica and with Nicola at this respect. Um, in the sector of, uh, in, in sectors like, like this one, like building renovation, individuals have the capacity to, 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 to create powerful dynamics. And uh, it is very important to reach out to individuals to encourage them to become active players in the energy transition. So in this sense, advisory one-stop shops, technical assistance programs, information campaigns uh, would be, uh, I think, extremely useful to assist individuals, homeowners, associations, and all, all the actors playing an active role in this uh, sense. Thank you, Christina. Um, indeed, I think that um, the, the, what you just explained are problems that are actually present in, uh, in, uh, in, many, in many places, many member states. Of course, we also see that the development of climate change events uh, in, uh, in our southern European countries uh, make um, that probably the cooling will be a real challenge very soon. Um, and not only the heating, but uh, this is certainly something that uh, um, is, is, is actually becoming more and more um, evident. And of course, another element that we consider interesting in this conversation is uh, the um, role model that uh, public buildings can, uh, can play and uh, the uh, capacity of them to uh, indicate and create uh, this demand that Nicola was actually uh, talking about earlier as uh, uh, still insufficient. Okay, so I will uh, like to ask uh, Jordi and Quentin, which are uh, representing two uh, members, two of our 
members um, in, uh, in the European Alliance to Save Energy to tell us what they take from what they heard and uh, what kind of um, um, uh, contribution the private sector could, uh, could give and your own companies, which are actually leaders in the energy efficiency technologies. And I give the floor to Quentin Galland, who is the Director for Public Affair, Affairs of uh, Knauf Insulation. Quentin, you have the floor. Thank you, Monica, uh, and thank you very much, Christina and Nicola, for, for your insights and views this morning. Um, so you, you said it, uh, Monica, Knauf Insulation is one of the worldwide manuf uh, manufacturer of mineral wool insulation. So in essence, we breathe and we live for energy efficiency. And so it's interesting this morning to hear as well how Spain in particular and the Commission uh, see and envisage technical assistance and the issues uh, and barriers that are along the way. So energy efficiency first, and I think this has been uh, mentioned directly or directly in the previous um, insights perspectives. Uh, energy efficiency is, is the first fuel uh, in, in, in with regards to the building. And that's the energy that we do not consume as consumers. Um, so uh, actually the renovation wave is a clear opportunity to streamline renovation throughout Europe. Um, and it's all about delivering energy efficiency. So renovation is a must. Um, and actually the question here nowadays and what has been said for, for Spain and, and from the commission side is that we know that on the one hand, funding streams are made available and they are on the table for uh, rolling out renovation. And next to that, we have as well uh, policy instruments. So the, the, the landscape uh, is there. So one could say that the stars are aligned for uh, rolling out renovation at the rate that we need to make sure that we, co uh, we, we achieve the ambitions, the 2050 ambitions. Uh, but te technically speaking, and that has been said as well, this is not what we see on, on the ground. So the actual implementation of the renovation wave is a huge challenge. Um, and, and technical assistance in this respect can be seen as one solution, can be seen as a third pillar next to policy, next to funding streams that can help making sure that the renovation wave delivers its promises. So um, two weeks ago, I was at the, at the C4E forum in, in Romania, and there around 100 participants gathered and talked about energy efficiency in Eastern Europe. And one key topic came at every table. It was all about technical assistance. Um, and so there is clearly a momentum about the topic of technical assistance, particularly here I'm taking the example of technical example, I'm taking the, the technical assistance from the example of, of what has been discussed at the C4E forum. But clearly this shows beyond what has been said also today that there, there is a momentum to roll out technical assistance. But then what do we mean? And how do we roll out technical assistance? Um, and here, we could look at this from two perspectives. On the one hand, from the <coughs> public, public, sorry, I hear some um, yes. microphone. Madame Berger, peut-être you can close your mic. Ah, thank you, Monica. So, um, from two perspectives. On the one hand, the uh, the, the the building uh, that are owned by public sector and those coming from the residential sector which is the huge uh, elephant in the room as well. Um, so from a public perspective, and that has been said, the public sector is expected to lead by example. And so here, the provisions that have been included in the uh, proposal for the energy uh, efficiency directive are already a good step towards ensuring that all public buildings would go through renovation. But then actually what we see on the ground is that sometimes, uh, if not most of the time, municipalities do use technical assistance at the end when they have a clear ID in mind. And maybe this process should be reversed and making sure that technical assistance comes at, at the very first stages of any ID that uh, municipalities could roll out. But maybe we could look at this from a different perspective where we could say that technical assistance should no longer be linked to any projects at local level. And rather saying that technical assistance is a prerequisite where municipalities would be helped out in assessing the needs of their building stock and then helping out municipalities to uh, provide 
roadmaps and uh, ideas to, to, to renovate uh, local buildings. So that, that is one way we can look at it. Then from a residential perspective, um, uh, the, the PPD uh, will be published and, and proposed by the commission within the coming month. And clearly that is a huge opportunity as well to, to make sure that some of the provisions are linked to technical assistance so that this can also be delivered on the ground. Um, technically speaking, uh, provisions that relate to financial incentives or those relating to information. And there, there are huge opportunities as well to help the residential sector to, uh, to get access to the right information. But here, clarity needs to be made. And there is, this is something that Nicolas and Christina have been saying as well, is that there are multiple tools and solutions to look at uh, technical assistance. It can be one-stop shops, it can be trainings, but actually there is a lack of clear information on the ground for the residential sector and the owner, so for those owning uh, residential buildings, to understand what type of, uh, renovation work they can actually perform and what kind of funding stream is actually available for them to make it happen. Um, so that is one thing, getting clarity on the ground to help um, those who have uh, a building or a flat, whatever. And next to that, uh, maybe we could also start thinking of bridging and creating partnerships with um, mortgage providers, banks, for instance, so that they could, for instance, look at the variety of building stocks that they have in their portfolio for the residential sector and could look at reopening, for instance, some of the contracts that they have for mortgage for poor performing energy efficient uh, energy building and to help those uh, building <coughs> getting to the extra um, the extra uh, extra level when it comes to energy performance. So these are a few ideas. Uh, definitely the EED and the EPBD are uh, two tools that could help rolling out policies on the ground linked to cohesion policies to make sure that uh, renovation does actually happen on the ground and technical assistance should definitely be one of the pillar of the renovation. Thank you. <coughs> so thank you very much. Uh, we are uh... <coughs> a little bit running um, behind, but doesn't matter. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say that um, there is, among the people who ask the question, somebody is called <coughs> Spectateur Anonyme, and I don't like very much the Spectateur Anonyme, maybe it's a technical issue, uh, but I would ask the Spectateur Anonyme to put a name on him or her so that we can answer his or her question. Jordi, you have the floor, is the Public and Government Affairs Manager from Signify Iberia. Thank you, Monica, and thanks all the panelists for the, for the insights. Well, at Signify, we are really excited about the, the momentum and the opportunities that the European Union and the national governments had offered to create a, a more green and digital future for Europe. Uh, representing the lighting industry, uh, we understand that this is the right moment and we are in the right business uh, for, for support these transitions. As we have the technology, we have the funds, and we have the ambitions. We, as a company, as a government, and, and also as a society, have the ambitions to drive in this green direction. And at the same time, uh, we need to move from these ambitions to real actions. And we see a gap in, in this area. Uh, and this movement also requires uh, regulations and technical assistance uh, to turn the funds into strategic investments in, in the country or, or at the country level. And uh, in that sense, uh, we see three big areas that requires uh, some urgent action or, or attention, uh, because the current technologies need updated regulations from, from the government. At the same time, uh, technical assistance is needed uh, for the fund implementation. And we aim for, for projects to fill this gap that, that, that I mentioned between these ambitions and the real results that, that, we, that we need. And, and let me briefly deep dive in, in these three areas. Uh, first of all, we've, we have the technology available that allows uh, the green and digital transitions. For instance, in our industry, uh, connected lighting can offer uh, savings, energy savings, up to 80%, a short return of investments, and the digitalization of our infrastructures in cities, in buildings, and, and also in homes. Uh, but to embrace these new technologies, we need updated regulations from, from the government. Uh, let me just put an example in, in this area. 
Uh, in Spain, the new lighting regulation for road down streets uh, will be published in the following weeks, replacing the current one from 2008. Uh, in this uh, previous uh, regulation from, from lighting in roads and streets, uh, it's not included the connected lighting since this technology is available for cities since 2012. So we need to move in the, in the regulation and embrace the technologies uh, to, to put in place these, these projects. Uh, on the other hand, we have the funds available to, to invest and digitalize and, and our, our economy. Uh, the countries have released the national recovery and resilience plans uh, to fit the, the national needs with the, with the European target. But at the end, we see that uh, we need to include some technical assistance at the national and regional level, because this technical assistance uh, will uh, provide us more staff, skills and experience that optimize the, observation, the absorption rate of, of these funds, uh, meaning that we are going to really invest uh, the funds available and, and, do, and, and um, forget uh, the, the big amounts. Uh, and at the same time, we need to maximize the impact and the sustainability of the projects. And, and this means spending strategically the, the, the funds. And finally, uh, minimize the irregularities. The technical assistance will allow us to spend correctly uh, these funds. Um, in, this, in this area, we also need to reduce the bureaucracy and increase some institutional communications, as, as has been mentioned, uh, in order to ensure that people and companies and, and uh, administrations know about the programs. And this will provide us the speed uh, needed uh, to, the, to these investments. And finally, regarding the gap between the, the ambitions in, in energy efficiency and real actions, uh, we need that we uh, we need to force the, the renovation rate and, and more than double uh, the renovation rate in, in buildings and, and but also cities. Uh, buildings are responsible of 40% of energy consumption in Europe. And uh, today, 70% of the buildings are energy inefficient. So we have a, a real gap and, and a real opportunity to invest. And if we move to, to cities, only 20% of the line points in, in the streets in Spain are LED, uh, despite these technologies available from 2008, 2010, and only 5% are connected. So, so this is a big gap in, in this area. And we see great investment opportunities in, in this renovation uh, wave in, in both cities and, and, and buildings. And at the end, this is a, a call to action to, to governments and companies to, to accelerate the decarbonization and become more digital using the current technologies, and also to provide the regulations, the technical assistance, the trainings, and, and the communications actions needed uh, for, to, to obtain this green and digital future for Europe. Thank you very much. I think that uh, these three or four questions have been put in, uh, in uh, uh, line, and that is certainly the cooperation also between the private and the public, the role model of the, of the public sector, the capacity of putting together and use properly at the right level the uh, funds and the uh, tools available, and the need also of putting together these tools somehow. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if Christina and Nicola would like to add something at this stage after uh, we heard each other and then we move quickly to the next panel because I know that Madame Berger has to leave us uh, earlier. Christina, Nicola? Monica, if, 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 if you allow me, just, just a couple of comments. The first is that I always thought that development is heliocentric. And Christina just demonstrated that the sun has an impact on the way in which, in which economies and society operate. I, I just wanted to, to uh, just, just, just a couple of comments. And is there is a lot of money out there. Uh, these are extraordinary times, if you think about it. They're in countries, particularly in the South, the combination of, of structural funds and uh, and, uh, and, and the uh, resilience and recovery facility makes a, a gigantic opportunity, but there's an extraordinary challenge also, because let's face it, the real problem that we will have is uh, how to construct a pipeline of project that is capable of absorbing all these resources. And technical assistance is there. Now, we are all, probably when we think about technical assistance, we think about the commission and clearly uh, uh, Natalie is there uh, and the, the, the TSI is one, is one instrument. Uh, the, the structural funds uh, departments are doing what they can by setting up uh, 
uh, instrument that are at the disposal of, of member states and regions. But the largest chunk of this uh, uh, technical assistance is in the member states, is in the member states. 3%, if I don't remember, if I remember correctly, of the overall allocation of the funds is in the hand of member states to devise and to set up technical assistance, uh, the technical assistance tools. What I can assure you, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Christina uh, knows it well, is that in the negotiation that we are having now uh, with all the member states for the strategies and the programs, the question of capacity, not only related to the renovation wave, but also to the renovation wave. The question of capacity and, and, and public administration is at the center of that negotiation because experience shows that if you don't have if you don't build that capacity, you can pour all the money you want into the system, it will never work. And so what I can assure also to the anonymous uh, uh, participants is that the commission is engaged and committed to have serious conversation with the member state. And we had it already in the context of the resilience and uh, recovering resilience facility, but also in the context of cohesion policy to uh, create roadmaps. Uh, and this is part of the regulations, in fact member states have to develop roadmaps uh, to, to address the, 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 the administrative capacity issue. So uh, I think uh, that the, the instruments are there. Now the question is, is, is to use them and, uh, and we will do uh, whatever we can in, 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 our, in our responsibility to ensure that those things will happen. Thank you, Nicola. Cristina? Really? Yes, um, in fact, 3.5% of the funds are <laughs> oriented to technical assistance. So it is even more than what Nicola just uh, said. Mm, and, and I agree that uh, this is an issue. This is very important. And, uh, and in Spain, we are working on this uh, roadmap of uh, building uh, capacity. And um, at the same time, uh, as we are very um, aware of the situation with um, the lack of incentives for individuals and the big administrative burden that they have to uh, overcome to, um, to, to, to go ahead to implement, to, to put on place those uh, projects uh, of, uh, for renovation of buildings, uh, one of the planned uh, reforms under the recovery plan and the, under the Spanish uh, recovery plan is, uh, uh, in fact, the creation of rehabilitation offices as, as one-stop shops aimed at uh, facilitating the management of subsidies, uh, financing taxation, and accompany the beneficiary throughout the entire renovation uh, process. But um, I mean, uh, this is in line what uh, in line um, uh, what we have said before, and and uh, and I agree uh, about the importance of, of uh, uh, technical assistance and building administrative capacity. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much, Christina, and thank you very much, Nicola, Jordi, and Kenta. In the meantime, we did discover the mysterious uh, <laughs> the person who is doing the the, the questions. Um, so thank you um, again, and I would like now to move quickly to the next panel, and the, the topic will be supporting member states to implement energy efficiency project. And I'm very glad to welcome Madame uh, Nathalie Berger. Um, who is the director for support to member states reform in DG reform. So we're really at the core of what we have been uh, talking about now. I must say that uh, Madame Berger or Berger, I don't know, you will tell us um, that um, we are um, particularly uh, happy of the creation of an instrument dedicated to the renovation wave. I think that uh, this was certainly done because you realized all the difficulties that we just spoke about. And uh, probably you can briefly explain to us how the, how the instrument work. And if you had uh, some feedback that you can talk to us about from member states on this instrument, please, Madame, uh, uh, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mrs. Bassoni. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you uh, this morning. I mean, it's a, it's virtual. I will be looking forward to the day when we can do this in presence, but uh, it is very, very good and, and effective. 
uh, to be there. So indeed, uh, we are we are a recently established director general, but we, we do already have a lot of experience in providing technical assistance and technical support to the member states. Uh, for uh, their uh, their reforms, and uh, we do intervene in a very wide range of areas uh, that are key to today's uh, big political and policy agenda, like, for example, the green transition, the green uh, deal, uh, the digital transition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, we, I, I, I will very briefly outline our work and uh, this technical support instrument before coming uh, back in more detail on our uh, renovation wave flagship project and tell you about the reactions from the member states. So what do we do and what is the support that we provide? So in DG reform, we work to provide the best and the most appropriate expertise, European and international, to support the member states in designing and implementing the reforms that will create jobs and sustainable green growth. We do this through our technical support instrument. This is a program which is um, embedded in a regulation, so adopted by the Parliament and Council for which we have an envelope of 864 million euros for the multi-annual budgetary framework 2021-2027. So around 110, 115 million per year. Um, the program operates on the basis of demand or request by the member states. So it's very important to keep in mind that we are not imposing a specific reform to any given member state. We are intervening in support to requests that come from the member state in key reform areas. And we work on the basis of uh, annual cycles and annual calls. So far, since 2017, we have designed and launched more than 1,000 projects, more than 1,200 projects in 27 member states under our technical support instrument and uh, our uh, predecessor program, the uh, Structural Reform Support Program. Now we are at a crucial period of time in the year because we are preparing the next cycle. So for 2022, for which member states can send us their requests by uh, the 31st of October. And e each member state, you have a contact point that is called a coordinating authority. So the coordinating authority gathers all the projects or requests coming from the different entities. And these can be national or regional or local entities and um, they uh, make a first, I would say, screening and a selection on the basis of the quality of the request and uh, priority um, and maturity of the request, and then they convey these to us. And uh, we, we have more and more success. So for 2021, we had more than 700 requests. Uh, we were able to support 226. Plus, we issued an additional call during the year to facilitate the implementation of the National Recovery and Resilience Plans. And there we have taken on an additional 2023 project. So it's a, it's a lot. And the major difference to, to grasp between this program and the other traditional programs or funds of the European Union is that we do not send money, we do not give money, there is no system of co-financing from the member states. We provide no money, we provide brains, <laughs> we provide skills and we provide technical assistance. We use our own competence and expertise within DG reform, but we also work with colleagues from the policy DGs in the Commission. So here it can be uh, DG Grow, DG Climate, DG Environment. And we also externalize or we import 
some expertise from external actors, which can be international organization like the OECD, the World Bank, the Council of Europe, uh, or um, uh, national development agencies, like for example, uh, Expertise France, France Strategy, GDV, GDZ, uh, GZD, sorry, for Germany. And uh, we also use uh, consortia. So we, we do a uh, public procurement. Um, we have introduced a novelty for the 2022 cycle, which is to design on the basis of the needs expressed by the member states, some flagship initiatives. So these are pre-prepared projects that respond to their needs and that allow to meet the great political objectives and agendas like the, the agenda of the Green Deal, um, the, of course, uh, renew and, and renovate. Um, and uh, we pre-prepare the projects, so we facilitate the presentation of the projects by the member states. Here, we are talking about uh, the renovation wave, which is extremely important. This is something that we have designed together with our colleagues in DG Energy and DG Regio, as well as with DG Clima and other commission services, employment, rural, et cetera. And we focus on the different uh, pillars, but I will come back uh, to, to this maybe later on. You asked me about the feedback from the member states. It's a bit early for this cycle because the deadline for the member states to submit their requests is ahead of us in 25 days, 31st of October. Uh, but we have advanced contacts with the member states and several of them have already indicated their interest in submitting a technical support request under our renovation wave flagship. We have already received draft requests for informal comments and we are now discussing with the member states to really further develop and fine tune the requests before they are formally submitted. So to try and really bring them to the best quality and maturity possible so that they really uh, flow, run through all uh, the, the analysis uh, criteria and grid. So based on the available information today, we really expect a solid interest in the member states for this flagship. And of course, I should uh, renew my thanks to the, to the colleagues in the other commission services. Uh, it is great thanks to their great collaboration that we have been able to design this flagship. And I would like to uh, salute colleagues from DG Energy and DG Regio in particular. And of course, uh, we have benefited from the active role of stakeholders for promoting this opportunity with the member states. Thank you very much, uh, Madame Berger. And uh, we move now to, um, we will come back to you in the, the end. I don't know if you can stay for another 20 minutes or so, uh, <clears throat> uh, because uh, I'm sure that you will want to comment also some of the things that will be said. And I would like now to welcome and to uh, give the floor to Mr. Renzo Tomellini, who is the head of the Technical Secretariat in the Cabinet of Italy, uh, Ecological Transition Ministry, formerly Environment Ministry. And I would like to <clears throat> ask you, uh, Mr. Uh, Tromellini, considering the vast reform, vast uh, resources that are available for, for Italy, that together with Spain is uh, the main um, receiver of the next generation EU, but also <clears throat> of the uh, structural funds in various forms, and considering also the um, uh, super bonus 110, which is a sort of flagship uh, program that Italy has been implementing, and that according to the last um, news uh, produced about 130,000 jobs, even if it is not perfect, and there are several issues that we could talk about. Uh, but I just wanted to know if uh, you are, if Italy is using the instrument or is um, envisaging to use the instrument of the technical assistance um, as outlined by Madame Berger. Um, and uh, the, if, if uh, the involvement of the local authorities, which in Italy is particularly 
complex, let's say, uh, is, uh, has been uh, envisaged, then also if there is anything that we as private sector can do to, um, to help. Yes. Please, you have the floor and welcome. Grazie, grazie. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, indeed, it is work in progress. Uh, you have insisted on the word uh, vast resources available. And the second time you mentioned this, Jordi, in his uh, intervention, has said that we are in the uh, right business at the right moment. Uh, all this is, is true. The vast resources is a great occasion, great opportunity, and a uh, warring responsibility. Eh? This is uh, an occasion that cannot be wasted, cannot be missed. So, um, Thank you for inviting uh, us to take part in this table. Uh, and uh, indeed, uh, you mentioned the conversation in Italy between the central power and the local powers. So Italy is uh, not a federal state, but uh, has uh, important autonomies and uh, an article in the Constitution, a title in the Constitution that uh, sets the role of regions and autonomous provinces. Um, I give uh, an example of this conversation that uh, you, you were mentioning, and it is uh, the Italian Ecological Transition Plan. You know that there is the uh, National Plan for uh, Recovery and Resilience, and uh, what we have done, uh, and actually myself, uh, uh, I've been uh, responsible to hold uh, the, the pen for this, uh, to create a document uh, in, um, in order to give a frame uh, cultural first, uh, political, administrative, uh, uh, strategic uh, frame of uh, the investment that are done with the recovery plan. Because this plan is indeed in this moment uh, in, uh, has been approved by the competent uh, interministerial uh, committee that is uh, chaired by the prime minister, Mr. Draghi, and is now uh, in, on the table of the regions and the provinces and the association of the of, uh, of the majors of, uh, of, of cities in order to uh, set uh, and put in gear this kind of, of dynamism. So when uh, uh, Mr. De Michelis says, uh, the ball is in the field of the member states, uh, he didn't use maybe the, exactly this word, but something like that. Uh, yes, the member states and the local authorities, uh, because then uh, the reality, the thing will be done at uh, local uh, at local level. It is clear, and you will not be surprised if I highlight how much energy efficiency is, uh, of course, important pillar of the Italian recovery plan. In the previous uh, short session, figures have been given. I will not repeat uh, the figures. Energy efficiency, energy performance of buildings is uh, very important topic. I could say hot topic if it was not mentioned that cooling is also uh, an, an important issue. Uh, but anyway, it's an essential topic in a moment uh, also when the prices uh, of electricity and gas uh, are affecting Italian family. Uh, we know that in Europe uh, and in Italy there is a point of energy poverty that is also something that is, uh, that is important for us and uh, since uh, in the transition, uh, in the ecological transition, we have a point of nobody should be left beyond, uh, this uh, parameter has to be taken into consideration. Uh, Italian recovery plan, you know, there are six missions, the percentage um, uh, larger is the mission to green revolution and ecological transition, and indeed one component uh, is dedicated to energy efficiency and innovation of building. I use this tone of voice because I think it's my duty to recall it, but I know very well that you know it, so I don't to go uh, into this. Uh, um, and, uh, uh, the figures are important, uh, uh, 22 billion uh, on energy efficiency projects, uh, and uh, 15 are with the recovery plan and seven are uh, with uh, the complementary fund. Complementary fund is something are uh, Italian national funds that are put on top up because the ambition of the planning was uh, uh, de facto uh, uh, more important than uh, the funds uh, that could be uh, allocated at the, at the level of the European Union. Union. So, aim is to reduce, of course, uh, energy consumptions in private and public uh, buildings. 
Um, important is what uh, the colleagues of the jury form have mentioned to us. Uh, very clear, Natalie has been adamant that they don't give money, but they provide assistance, they provide intelligence, they provide content, they provide network, and they provide in this important, important support. So here, of course, is the place where technical assistance I see uh, finds very naturally its, uh, um, its place. Um, but not only, not only because the point of the absorption, uh, you have said in your question, the absorption of such resources, uh, it is in the hands of local authorities and it is legitimate to ask ourselves uh, if uh, the local authorities are uh, robust enough uh, to do this. But this uh, is uh, not really in the hands of uh, the national uh, um, government, eh? so this is something where uh, in conversation with, uh, uh, in Italian, uh, since from the name, I guess, your Italian, the ANCI, Associazione Comuni, so the association of the local authorities, uh, the mayors, um, and um, the, could, be, could, be, could be useful. The, um, the, the, the pact of the mayor, uh, Pacto de Sindaci, is, uh, is also a, a forum where uh, this kind of, 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 of ideas, I think, uh, could be naturally be, uh, be brought. So in our case, as I say, when uh, commenting at the beginning on the word vast, uh, vast is uh, ambition, is uh, responsibility, is uh, uh, the, the stress to ensure that the project planning uh, is uh, correctly uh, executed and, uh, uh, and uh, when, where appropriate, uh, technical assistance is important to be, uh, is a resource to, uh, to tap. Um, I can mention the Italian National Portal for Energy Efficiency of Buildings that is already designed to help uh, citizens and administrators uh, to manage uh, energy efficiency projects. And uh, here uh, we can have uh, um, some uh, uh, additional uh, uh, one-stop uh, setup in order to, uh, to help the, the functioning of, uh, of, this, of, of this portal. Um, we want also to provide the citizens with information and business uh, with information about energy mapping of buildings, uh, compliance with sector regulation, evaluation of potential for efficiency, selection of priority for action, um, redevelopment plans uh, in stages, uh, tools uh, that are available for the purpose. Uh, these are all uh, important components that would add uh, value to uh, our action and, uh, and, uh, and support uh, the actors in this uh, transformation. And uh, last but not least, uh, which is the training of professional skills, because uh, who does this? Where are the technicians uh, who will come and fix uh, my new uh, device at home? So there is uh, the point of uh, a cultural change, a economic change, transition in terms of energy sources, but also transition in terms of uh, skills of the operators in our system at all level. So, uh, yes, uh, to your question about the potential and the role of technical assistance in the in the in the most moment and uh, and locations that is uh, that are appropriate. Thank you, grazie mille, Dr. Tomellini. Uh, I think we will come back very briefly at the end uh, on on a couple of the points you mentioned, and I would like now to, without further ado. Uh, to give the floor to uh, Brooke uh, Braley, who is the head of EU Affairs of Rockwell. And I must say that uh, thanks to him also this uh, initiative came to, uh, came to light as it has been a real um, you know, pusher in this sense uh, for, uh, for, uh, for working on, on this. And I do thank him for that. Brooke, you have the floor. And by uh, the way, I just, uh, I just wanted to, to, you will certainly do it yourself, but just to, to mention, please, uh, what uh, not only what the contribution of the private sector is that Jordi and Quentin talked about briefly earlier, uh, 
uh, but also what are the main obstacles that uh, you, you, you find um, and, uh, and probably the, the issue of understanding the importance of something is, does not mean necessarily that this something is actually done and, uh, and uh, maybe it would be interesting also to find out from you uh, what are some suggestions and from Julie that will come later um, for that the suggestion that we could do. <clears throat> Please, Brooke. Thank you, Monica, and thank you to all the participants. They're very interesting points uh, so far. So uh, I think I'm going to try to make three main points. And the first one is the extent to which we've seen a political shift uh, in climate and energy policy making. Uh, I remember, uh, I think it was seven years ago, uh, Business Europe at the time wrote in to uh, President Barroso complaining that the EU's climate objectives were too focused on the climate. And that kind of uh, lobbying just simply doesn't have a role today in, in the state of affairs. And where we are at the moment with the commitment to net zero, with the agreement around the Fit for 55 package, is to think about the next step. What comes next? How do we implement those goals? How do we deliver them? And nowhere is the challenge bigger, but also the potential benefits bigger uh, than in building renovation. As, as uh, one of us has already mentioned, we have to increase the renovation rate from its current 1% per year to at least two. And most analysis suggests that 3% would be safer in terms of climate neutrality. That's a doubling at least, but actually it's tougher than that because the deep renovation rate, which really delivers the greenhouse gas and air quality, jobs and other benefits is only at 0.2% at the moment. That has to increase by at least five to 10 times. Now, my second point uh, is, it is very encouraging to see how much more the Commission, European Investment Bank, World Bank and others are doing to try to provide more and more effective technical assistance. So I think it's really important that we in industry and other stakeholders recognize this and, and, and note this fact. Uh, for example, uh, the renovation wave flagship from Reform and Rejo is, is a real step in the right direction. So far, we have this kind of catch-22 situation where many member states are aware that there is potential support from Reform, but don't necessarily know how to access it. Often, they lack the resources to apply for additional resources. Um, we also see a kind of typical challenge that uh, there is the possibility to use 3.5% of the uh, MFF money for technical assistance, but often it's not taken up or it's not taken up in a way which is sufficiently joined up with new investment opportunities. So a lot is changing. But my third point, and this is where I'd like to go more into detail, is that we have to find ways to scale up this technical assistance support further and to make it more effective. Uh, a parallel which I often hear, which I like to make myself, is that this is a lot like the vaccination campaign. We have to make it easier for people to act and to renovate their homes than not to do so. Uh, and this is where there still seems to be quite a lot of progress to, to make. Now, for example, uh, the EU has something called the EU City Facility, which is a very interesting scheme. It's all about providing grants of roughly 60,000 euros to city neighborhoods in order to hire one or two, depending on the country, full-time people to prepare bigger applications, such as the one which Madame Berger has been speaking about. Um, so far, however, there's only enough funding for 200 of those applications, 12 million euros in total. This seems to be a, a clear area of priority to scale up, bearing in mind uh, what all the panelists have been saying about the need for local authorities to be able to act. Uh, a second point is that, in a way, all the services which the Commission, which Regio, which Reform, uh, Klima, uh, and others offer in terms of support, what the EIB offers in terms of support, it's a bit bewildering to applicants. People lack the capacity to navigate the, the almost maze, the labyrinth of available technical support. Now, something which uh, I know that Reform and Regio and the EIB speak about a lot is what they call signposting. People need to know where to be able to turn to for advice, but there too we have some obvious challenges which perhaps we can address. The, the advisory hub, which is currently run by the EIB and which ECFIN is taking over, uh, so far has only been in English. So you could have very good ideas at local level, you could be really plugged into your local community, but uh, there is this language barrier which hampers applications. Another issue is sometimes the lack of capacity, which we hear 
exists within the Commission and within the EIB to process those applications to ensure that people, if they are, uh, or authorities, if they are applying for support, at least get an answer, at least get told where to go uh, to perhaps be able to meet their requests. And I, I have heard some cases of a, an 80 to 90 percent rejection rate for those applications purely because there is not enough capacity to process them. And this, of course, sends a very negative signal to, to, to uh, regions, to cities about EU technical assistance. Um, I, I think that maybe a, a really concrete example of where we believe uh, efforts should be maintained is in the renovation wave flagship opportunity, which Madame Berger has outlined. Now, again, this is a really excellent initiative, but the deadline is short. It's the 31st of October, like every year. The call, however, was only put out at the beginning of July. There's the summer holidays. There's the need for authorities in member states who have never applied for technical assistance in this area to figure out who their national coordinator is, how to prepare an application. Um, many times they don't know that reform can actually provide informal advice on how to do so. So it takes time for these good initiatives to seep down and to be disseminated. And therefore, one clear request, which uh, I think we can make ourselves, but also which we're hearing from numerous stakeholders, is that this flagship has to be maintained over the next years. Uh, we, we're confident, we hope that there will be many more applications this year, but uh, almost certainly not enough uh, to be in line with this big capacity gap, which we need to be able to close to double renovation rates. And I think a final point um, is that Mr. Tomalini spoke about workforce capacity gaps. Uh, this is a big issue. This is something which within Rockwell we are working to try and close. We're working to try to train more and more installers, uh, architects, so blue collars and white collar workers. Another capacity gap, a workforce capacity gap, which we talk about less is the administrative capacity gap. We don't yet know how many people are working in a technical assistance capacity within the member states. We don't know what the gap is. We can assume that the numbers are too low and that the gap is very significant compared to the needs to be able to meet the renovation wave goals and by association the net zero commitments. But we have to start really with a meticulous assessment of uh, what are those capacity gaps we need to close and then be in a position to be able to scale up uh, and to better promote the really excellent initiatives which are taking place within the Commission and the European Investment Bank and elsewhere. So thank you very much and looking forward to, to reactions. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Brooke. In the meantime, we do have some questions coming up, um, but I will first give the floor to uh, Julie Castro, who is the head of EU Affairs in Danfoss. Julie, on the same points. Yes, or many thanks, Monica. <laughs> and many thanks for inviting me today. Um, we're running a bit late, but I think that's actually an excellent sign because it means we've got a really vibrant and super important um, discussion here today. And I mean, if you ask me, I think this sort of notion of the technical assistance really is a make or break for the renovation wave. So it's very, very important to have all of this today. And it's very important to talk about the challenges we're facing. And I think on the positive side, I mean, a lot of what my colleagues have said directly reflects the input I got from colleagues as well. Because the first thing I did when I got this invite was to talk to my colleagues in markets to say, okay, what are you seeing on the ground? Um, and what they're seeing is issues that are actually, if, if you want um, to say it like that, banal, right? Um, and it's ones that uh, both uh, Brooke Puddles and Kantar mentioned. It's, uh, it's a lack of knowledge um, and it's lack of time. So lack of knowledge of what sort of uh, um, help is available out there, but then also lack of time um, and skills, maybe to some extent, to then actually process uh, those applications. So, um, but the fact that these are sort of pretty basic problems do not mean that the solution is, is, is basic, but it does underline that it's just hugely, hugely important to have this discussion about how best to make these technical assistance programs more appropriate for the markets uh, they're in. Um, and when I talk to colleagues, I can't hear Julie anymore. Can you? No, I think Julie has a technical issue. Ah, okay. Julie, are you back with us? No. So in the meantime, that Julie joins us again, 
Uh, I would like to ask directly to Madame Berger uh, if the flagship approach um, that it was in, done in 2021 is also considered for next year call. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Frassoni. Uh, maybe before coming to the future, I should uh, develop a little bit on, on what exactly in uh, the flagship I had mentioned before, that it was uh, building on, on three pillars. Uh, so we have first um, a pillar focused at building renovation policies in key areas that were also highlighted, uh, of course, in our renovation wave communication. And these include energy poverty, public buildings, and topics related to sustainable renovation. So this last area covers, for example, climate resilience skills and the circular economy. And given the many barriers that can hold back the renovation of buildings, we would always start with analyzing those barriers and the existing policies, and then develop tailored made action plans and build the capacity of the public administration. And the second pillar of the flagship focuses on the governance aspect of the renovation wave. Indeed, building renovation policies affect many public, private and civil society stakeholders across policy domains and across government levels. And with this activity, we propose to support the member states in mapping the stakeholders and support the setting up of an effective and inclusive governance and a consultation mechanism, possibly also making use of e-government solutions. And the third pillar is closer linked to the topic of the previous panel discussion this morning, and it focuses on co cohesion policy funding and on how to make the most of this significant source of funding under the next programming period. We have developed this activity package in close cooperation with our colleagues in DG Regio and the support will be targeted especially at managing authorities of cohesion policy funds, addressing specific barriers that may hold back the effective deployment of the cohesion policy funding for building renovation. So these are the, the three pillars and this is the main content of this flagship on the renovation way. Now, what about the future? So this is now something that we have proposed for the TSI 2022 and that member states can join and they will state their interest formally by the 31st of October. And we really hope to have a wide community of member states joining. Now for the other years, you know, I mentioned before that the technical support instrument is part of the multi-annual financial framework 2021-2027. So our instrument will be in place at least until 2027. Okay. The flagship technical project on renovation wave is designed for this very round of the technical support instrument. But of course, looking at the following year, we're going to take stock of the experience with our flagship approach for 2020, 20, sorry, 2022. So I'm absolutely confident that we will certainly continue to provide technical assistance in the area of building renovation in the following years. Maybe we will reconduct the same flagship, maybe we will adapt it, maybe we will extend it. We do not know yet because we really want to be able to react uh, swiftly to the needs of the, of the member states. But what I can say, is that the implementation of the renovation wave will remain a most important EU priority and priority for us at DG Reform for the foreseeable future. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Berger. And Julie came back to us. So please, Julie, you have the floor again. So where, where did you lose me? Ah, you, you actually had talked only for one or two minutes and you were talking about oh. the, uh, the importance of uh, of all uh, of all this so um, 
it's, it's okay. very weird. It timed out the connection. So uh, so I don't know where it was. But uh, what I wanted to say was that a lot of the input I got when I talked to uh, to colleagues in yeah. markets reflect what other colleagues have also said. OK, yeah. And that basically the issue is specifically around uh, around time and about sort of knowledge of what is out there. So, uh, you know, there's a, certainly a need. And then I mentioned a specific uh, um, example uh, that I got from my colleagues in southern Europe um, around hydronic dynamic balancing of buildings and temperature regulation. And, and that is an example of technology that has a very low uh, uh, or, or short payback time um, that we know has an effect. Um, and that works across a variety of buildings, but as it stands today, it is not included in the range of programs in uh, in uh, in France, for instance, and also only indirectly included in in Italy. And I think what we can really help with as a company is to make sure that the technologies that are included, the technologies that are pointed out to the people who then want to invent uh, invest in energy efficiency programs, are actually as technically adequate um, uh, as possible. And there, of course, as a company. Uh, and as a sector, we, we have a, a key role to play um, as technical experts. So we can be involved in those courses that are being set up. And another thing that we can do and are already doing is also to uh, to help develop uh, trainings, uh, technical guides, um, so on and so forth. We're doing that, again, very successful in Southern Europe and Spain, Italy in particular. We've done some on, on HVAC um, as an example. And there, I think, where we can take that to the next step by working together is to also make sure that the uh, that uh, public entities for instance national energy agencies uh, can uh, can approve and endorse and use this material themselves um, and by doing that we can address one of the big well actually the two big problems we're talking about what about sort of capacity um, in the shape of input but also in terms of time Thank you very much, Julie. Um, I am. I think that Madame Berger had to leave us, and the same thing went for Mr. for uh, for the head of, of the technical assistance of a technical uh, um, cabinet of Mr. Cingolani. But uh, uh, Brooke, I don't know if you would like to add something because I saw that uh, uh, that the the. Um, there were a couple of questions for you, and indeed there are uh, issues that uh, concern also the implementation at local level or of EPD, notably in Italy. Unfortunately, the Italian representative is no more with us, but we will uh, certainly send in these uh, considerations. Uh, Brooke, I don't know if you want to add something before we move quickly to the next, uh, to the next session. Thank you, Monica. I, I think, I guess the main point to make is that it's not enough just to have the current level of technical assistance support capacity at EU level and at national level. That clearly has to be increased. That's something which is coming clearly through the comments. It's something which I hear a lot from speaking to stakeholders, both here in Brussels and at national level. But I think above all, maybe the most urgent priority is for us to see a higher level political ownership of technical assistance capacity uh, within the commission, for example. Now, uh, I, I think that the executive vice president, for example, Mr. Timmermans, uh, his, his progress on the Green Deal to a very large extent depends on the technical assistance resources which the commission and uh, other partners like the EIB are able to deploy. And yet so far we aren't yet seeing sufficient championing by Mr. Timmermans and others of those resources which the Commission has at its disposal. Uh, Madame Berger was speaking about the fact that reform is demand driven. In other words, you have to know about those services to be able to consider applying for them. It seems that more and more we've got to take a much more proactive approach. Um, it's got to be really, to put it bluntly, thrust under the noses of uh, local authorities, of regions, even of ministries, that this support is available, uh, that they can grasp that opportunity and that they will be helped to do so. I think it's this change of approach, just as much as an increase of capacity, uh, which more and more has to be prioritized. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Brooke. Uh, thank you to all speakers. Uh, and I don't know if Julie wants to add anything. Um, but uh, but I would then... Monica, no, yeah. just to say, I very much agree with what Brooke said. Now uh, my own intervention became a little bit sort of uh, chopped up. But I mean, what I hear from my colleagues in the local markets is exactly what, what Brooke and Quentin before him said about this sort of lack of people actually knowing what they can access funding for and then how to tangibly go about that. So... 
Thank you, thank you very much. I think we will have to really work on uh, on uh, on that also uh, with with the Commission, but also with our national and local contacts, because uh, this is indeed something that, in terms of exchange of best practice, could become quite relevant. Let's then move to the to the next uh, to the next panel, boosting technical assistance through EU legislation, and I'm very glad to welcome Paola Pino, Director for Just Transition Consumer Energy Efficiency Innovation in DG Energy. Um, good morning, Paola. Thank you very much for being here. And I do apologize for the uh, slight delay that we are experiencing in this panel, but it was really you know, difficult to, to, to keep the time. I think there are so many things to be said. So uh, I, I just wanted to, to um, ask you, you have experienced uh, a big success, uh, even in terms of a raise of awareness uh, of the renovation uh, wave narrative, uh, and uh, with, of course, all the difficulties that we have heard. And I would like, uh, I would like to know what uh, is that you see is needed also in terms of legislation, because we are just at the beginning of the Fit for 55 uh, conversation and political and uh, legislative process. Um, what is it you would think it will be needed uh, to, to, to make it work on the ground? And uh, do you see from your end uh, any uh, particularly, uh, particular remark to be done in terms of technical assistance contribution to uh, what you try to achieve? Mm -hmm. Paola, you have the floor. Thank you, Monica. Thank you for the invitation. Well, the good thing about uh, it being slightly delayed is that I could listen in already to the previous uh, panel and, 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 and interesting uh, exchanges. Um, I would start by saying um, the following. We have several tools of, at our disposal. One is legislation, clearly, and we've seen that and we've put uh, out a big uh, uh, and very ambitious package back in, in July. And I know some of it has already been, been, been mentioned uh, here this morning. Then we have the financing tools that need to go uh, uh, with it and the financing means public, of course, to lever uh, on these uh, uh, on the investments, but we cannot do it all um, with uh, public financing only. We need private investment and then we need technical assistance. And it's absolutely crucial uh, in this. It, it's an, a, a crucial element if we are to succeed in, in the implementation of the policies that, are we, uh, that we are putting forward. So just to kickstart, and, uh, and in terms of legislation, uh, again, I understand you've already went into uh, a lot of it. Um, within the, the Fit for 55 package, or also Green Deal package, as we then called it in, in, in July, the idea is really to deliver this ambitious tar target of at least 55% uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2030. And here, energy efficiency is an absolute um, must if we are to deliver on this, on, on this target. And, uh, and you could see from the combination of uh, proposals that we put forward that it's really going and, and, and uh, targeting all sectors uh, from, uh, from buildings to transport to uh, uh, industry. Uh, so there, the, all sectors have a contribution to make to this uh, to this target. Energy efficiency needs to be prioritized across across all the sectors. It's really the horizontal, uh, no reg regrets, no brainers. Uh, and yet, I'm always surprised to see that, despite the fact that it should be really a no brainer, obviously saving energy or being more cost efficient should be uh, really no brainer. And yet, there are obstacles to its effective uh, implementation. Uh, and, and these are not least linked also precisely to, um, to, 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 to often to the, the, the lack of um, skills, to the lack of technical skills to implement that. Uh, the, the Energy Performance of Buildings Directive has also uh, been mentioned. It has not been put forward uh, yet. We're working uh, currently on the revision. It's part of the package. It's part of the, the legal proposals that should lead uh, to the 55% uh, reduction target. And there we're looking into elements uh, 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 which will uh, allow us to double, at least double the annual energy uh, renovation rate of buildings by 2030. This is huge. This is huge in terms of, uh, 
of, uh, of, of target and uh, double the existing um, energy, annual energy renovation rate. Uh, we want to uh, modernize the buildings and their systems for, for heating, for cooling, for ventilation, for uh, charging, uh, using more digitalization. Uh, we are also looking into uh, proposing the introduction of mandatory minimum energy performance standards, uh, which should really be the trigger to uh, allow to have more renovations, because so far we have indicated how renovations should ideally be done, but what was missing was the trigger to make such uh, renovations uh, happening. Now, all of this um, will only be possible, and once uh, it, it, it goes through uh, the co-decision with the European Parliament, with the, with the member states, with the necessary technical assistance which we'll need to follow. I mentioned financing. Again, there we're walking the talk, and there are really unprecedented means that have been put uh, forward uh, with uh, the MFF for 2021-27. But, uh, and and uh, uh, including the next generation EU, uh, where we're really foreseeing that that 30% of the resources um, have been earmarked for climate actions, uh, and we're seeing now also in the recovery and uh, plans from the the member states that member states have understood. Uh, that there is a momentum uh, for energy efficiency and very clearly, very concretely for the renovation of buildings. So we could see in the, in the, in the recovery and resilience plans of member states that the big share of these funds is going into, uh, into um, uh, renovation of, of, of buildings and in, into construction. We've calculated around 60 billion uh, euro going uh, directly into, into construction. Um, but then, as said, we, we more than ever we will need uh, technical assistance. Uh, so when we also look at our financing tools, we're looking into uh, uh, blending operations, and we're looking into combining technical assistance with loans, with grants, with project development uh, assistance facilities, with one-stop shops, which uh, uh, precisely will allow to 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 make. Uh, these policies a, a reality. And here we cannot uh, say it too often. Uh, technical assistance is essential to help removing the technical, the administrative, and sometimes even the financial barriers. It's essential to build capacities of stakeholders and, and potential aggregators. And it's essential to help developing innovative financing solutions to crowd in private capital into energy efficiency uh, investments. Now, we have um, uh, several uh, uh, examples of EU technical assistance projects at EU uh, uh, level. Uh, a very uh, uh, renowned one is ELENA, which is really the main EU uh, technical assistance facility for energy efficiency and has proved successful in addressing um, really key barriers uh, that will prevent financing and, and, and has uh, allowed to trigger investments in, in energy efficiency and building renovation. It's already uh, a classic. It's, it's, it's all 11 years old. Uh, it, it mobilized uh, more than 7 billion euro in sustainable energy and transport with a, a leverage factor, and this is also a very interesting element, of um, uh, around th 34. So for each euro from the, the Elena facility, um, it could leave a 34 uh, euro. Now, we will continue um, through the Elena project to build uh, strong pipelines of projects under the Invest EU advisory hub. Um, and, and, and clearly continue to finance project development assistance to, 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 to trigger the necessary um, energy efficiency investment. Uh, another example is um, the project development assistance, assistance which offers um, assistance to both uh, public and private project promoters uh, in order to implement sustainable energy uh, investments. And this project uh, development assistance has supported so far 52 projects with a total of um, expected investment volume of uh, 1.1 uh, billion uh, euro. Um, it aims to build 
again, technical, financial and legal expertise, uh, which is required for uh, project uh, development and uh, to remove existing market barriers uh, in order to set up and, and implement um, project uh, pipelines. It's addressing uh, basically all the, the, the main actors in, in, in the field of, of, of uh, buildings, public authorities, uh, public or private infrastructure operators, energy service companies, property owners, um, and of course also um, services and industry as, as really uh, target uh, groups. We also have the European City Facility, which is uh, complementary to the uh, project development assistance and to the LENA facilities. And this European City Facility is a pan-European uh, um, project which has been set up under uh, Horizon 2020 and here the idea is to provide uh, tailor-made and really simplified financial support in the form of, of lump sums, um, 60,000 euro uh, worth lump sums and is related to local services in more than 200 European cities and municipalities uh, so as to uh, allow uh, these cities and the municipalities to translate their sustainable and energy action plans uh, into, uh, uh, into financial terms in the form of, of investment uh, concepts. And last but non, not least, I would say a word on the national ELENAS, um, which uh, uh, illustrates that because the needs in this sector vary, um, we cannot only work at EU uh, level, so uh, and even at national level. Some solutions need to be developed regionally and 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 and, and deployed locally. So these national Elenas um, are aiming to support um, very concretely companies uh, that uh, wish to improve energy efficiency, municipalities uh, which are carrying out large uh, scale renovation programs, <clears throat> but also. Uh, citizens that want to renovate their homes and 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 need to know whom to contact and whom to contact uh, contact in the best way, because uh, everybody who has gone through uh, renovation uh, projects in our own uh, homes know how 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 burdensome it it, it it can be, and not even speaking just of the financial uh, means. Uh, and to give you a very concrete example, and um, one issue I've been discussing uh, recently also with, with my colleagues, uh, how far are we going in the deployment of uh, heat pumps, for instance? And, and guess what? I am constantly facing uh, uh, reactions of uh, uh, acquaintances saying, well, even if we have tried, we would be interested, then we do not find somebody to to, to install it, we do not find the necessary um, uh, guarantee that there will be uh, maintenance, we do not find the necessary skills. So all of this needs to be really set up and that's why I would uh, insist technical assistance is a key element of our policy if we are to, to really uh, succeed. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you very much, uh, Paula. And I think that a lot of us can uh, actually echo what you just said in terms of finding the right professionals. And this is certainly one of the points uh, uh, that are very relevant also for the concrete implementation. And the same thing goes for the local uh, and municipal level. I think that all of you basically mentioned this uh, issue that uh, uh, in one day, uh, in one moment, will we'll need to be a little bit more systematically faced also from the European level. And I'm very glad now to give the floor uh, to our to our two last speakers, uh, which is Bertrand uh, Desprez, who is Vice President, uh, EU Government Affairs of Schneider Electric, who is also the Vice uh, Chair of the European Alliance to Save Energy. Bertrand, you have the floor. Thank you uh, very much, Monica, and good morning, everyone. And uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of things have been said. Uh, I can definitely echo what you say, uh, Monica and Paula, because I'm in the process to renovate a, an apartment in Brussels. And I can tell you it's really the air, right? If, if you want to, um, to, to, to target, you know, a good level of, uh, of energy efficiency. But that being said, I think um, where we all agree is that the renovation wave uh, cannot be a failure uh, because there are a lot of money on the table. 
and and there is a momentum and we know that uh, if we want to succeed with the climate target we have to do it now i just want to remind and it has been said during the conversation that there are a number of gaps and we should not uh, undervalue under assess uh, um, the, 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 the size and the scale of those gaps like skills like the fragmentation of the value chains the fact that every building has a unique asset perspective and that it's really hard to address right and and i don't think and that what you said pola that technical assistant can address all of that but for sure it has a key role to play my second kind of cautious point is to say money is super important, but it cannot solve the problem. And I've read like many of you, I guess, you know, the report of the court of auditor, the EU court of auditor by, from 2020, which basically said that a lot of money has been wasted, public money, in the renovation of social housing, in particular in, in Eastern Europe. Because simply, you know, like target benchmark were not uh, done in a proper way, right? And I think not only because we need to address energy efficiency, but because we need to avoid wasting money of EU tax players, that's super important that, you know, we fix the right framework for it. So in that respect, indeed, technical assistance is super important. I think the issue about one's um, stop shop is a, a very valuable one, especially in my experience of today where I need to renovate my flat. I can see clearly that you need uh, such support. Uh, but we, I think we need also to consider two aspects. First, that uh, I think this morning it was mainly about residential buildings and about public buildings. And I think we should not forget about private non-residential buildings, which are about 20% of energy consumption of the total energy consumption of the building sector. And this is not a sector which is doing so well in terms of energy efficiency. And on the contrary, it's actually worse when you look at the curve compared to residential and public that than again, public and, 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 and private. So I think we need really to consider technical assistance for all types of buildings. So that needs that it has to be tailor-made. And for that, I think in that, it has to be go, going, it has to go beyond information about uh, funding scheme available, which is one of the critical points and to cover three critical issues from my point of view. First, upskilling. Uh, it was mentioned, and what we can say and what we see every day is a shortage of skill of people who can support and can deploy the technologies. And that is something technical assistance has really to take into account. And since the session is about how the regulation can help, I would really argue in to, to have a definition of technical assistance looking at a critical role in bringing upscaling uh, for the building value chain. So, so that's a very important point. Second point, which is equally important or even more important, and this is what you say, uh, Paula, is about digital. In fact, for us as a tech company, digital is the best possible technical assistance. When you look at things like uh, BIM 5D, which is you know, the most sophisticated version of the building information modeling, you have everything uh, for the building value chain ready to do efficiency in the right way. And um, so that's an example, which is maybe a bit too much sophisticated for the rest of the uh, buildings, be it residential or public or, or public buildings, but you could have platform, you could have big data, you could have a lot of things that really can uh, bring the technical assistant in a digital form, and that could be super effective. So I think, again, looking at the regulatory definition of what could bring technical assistance, digital as a key role to play. Last but not least, uh, I just want to talk about system efficiency, right? And you mentioned Elena, I just, uh, uh, Paula, I want to mention Jessica, which is also a great program from the EIB, which actually goes beyond energy efficiency and look at flexibility. And this is typically, again, if I want to renovate my buildings, I would care and I should care about energy efficiency first, but I, I would also want to look at how can I install solar panel, right? So I think it's also important that when we define technical assistance uh, by law, and if we want to be more precise, and we should, we should go beyond energy efficiency, or so it should be first, but that look at you know, um, the decarbonization objectives that should be set. Last but not least, and again, it was said a few times, 
technical assistance cannot solve the issue on its own. And we need a very sound uh, regulatory framework. And here, again, I will bring three components which are complementary to technical assistance. First and foremost, it's an end, end result oriented framework. That means that we need to have a framework which sets mandatory uh, performance for buildings, but with a clear result to be achieved uh, at the end of the journey. That is very key that you know, and, and that should be also reviewed post ente. Um, and there are great examples in France. You have the decret tertiaire, for instance, for non residential building, which uh, every building. Buildings have to uh, lower by 20% its CO2 consumption by 2030, 30% by 2040. And, and, and then you support, you provide the right tool for, for the people to achieve this goal. But you need really to have a clear goal to achieve, and you have to have a post NT verification of the fact it has been effectively achieved. A second issue, which is also critical, is about indicators. I think one of the issues, and the Commission, I think, has completely understood that, is that the energy performance certificate, but also the private label, are not up to date. So really, to kind of uh, direct investment, but also help people to uh, to renovate their buildings. So it's super important that we have the right indicators that could be a critical tool. So to basically, you know, make the technical assistance. Um, effective enough, right? And, and here I know the commission has a couple of ID, digital logbook or things like that. Uh, but again, that's a very uh, important uh, element. And last but not least, but I already mentioned it, is really this digital roadmap, because again, from a point of view, there is a lack of innovation uh, within the building sector. Energy efficiency, renovation of buildings could be a critical moment to address this gap. But for that, we need to bring much more digital into the, into the uh, regulatory framework and into the reality of uh, building renovation. And, and, and technical assistance, again, could be a, a great uh, lever for that. So again, uh, just to conclude, super important technical assistance, but just to consider, I think, the bigger picture and, and, and put digital at core, and that will be uh, surely very helpful. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Bertrand. Thank you very much, Bertrand. And uh, I would like now to give the floor for the last intervention uh, to Harry Ferrar, who is the head of Global Public Affairs in Signify, and also the chair of the board of the European Alliance to Save Energy. Harry, please. Yeah, thank you, Monica. And thank you, Paula, also for staying on a, a little longer as we are running uh, late. Uh, I imagine that being last in line had the most insightful uh, remarks that would already have been made. So I just have two pragmatic proposals. Uh, so one is within the renovation wave to consider to create a, a dedicated program for renovation of schools. I think also then depending on the type of school, how also students can play a role in technical assistance. It could become part of their curriculum or, or let's say a term assignment huh, to, to make proposals for their schools. And it would also in a way have then built capacity because some, some of them have would also then uh, be able to utilize what they learn in, in their future jobs. And the second proposal that I would like to make is that this is not only about energy efficiency first, but also about European Commission first. And we have some experience in the past, even back to the Barroso cabinet, when there was enthusiasm for the renovation of European Commission buildings in Brussels. But then given all the complexity that we had to conclude, even uh, together with Connie Hedegaard, uh, that European Commission buildings would be the last ones to be renovated in Europe. Uh, so my question is also if the European Commission buildings uh, could be renovated as sort of a pilot or let's say as a front runner project. It's, it are 52 buildings uh, that I remember, uh, but that also based on that, uh, the learnings on technical assistance, but also on, let's say, further fine tuning of regulations that enable uh, the acceleration of renovation can be more broadly shared. And so that others learn from that. So th those are the two pragmatic proposals on schools mm -hmm. and on European Commission buildings. Thank you very much indeed. Paola, would you like to comment? Briefly. Yes, thank you all. Thank you for also for the very concrete proposal to focus on, on the renovation on, on, uh, on school buildings. Um, on, the, um, on, on the Commission first and, and the Commission uh, uh, 
showing, uh, giving the example, um, there is indeed uh, uh, such such renovation and, and modernization of the of the buildings uh, of uh, the commission going on. Now there is one issue which um, needs to be borne in mind: not all commission buildings are owned by the commission, so uh, several are still rented, and this, of course, um, makes it then more difficult to um, to implement. Uh, what uh, to, to implement what we're preaching, uh, so to say, uh, it's it's clear one of the obstacles. But for the for the buildings that are owned by the Commission, indeed, uh, the idea is to um, uh, gradually make them uh, more efficient and really uh, comply with the standards that we are uh, proposing and putting forward um, ourselves. So uh, thank you, thank you very much, Paula, and thank you very much to all of uh, our speakers. I think that I can, um, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, the first conclusion is that this will not be the last time we talk about this topic. Um, we will collect, uh, we will make a report about this uh, short uh, summary of this meeting, and we will sort of put together the proposals that have been uh, put forward by the different speakers. Um, we are also going to be in contact with our colleagues in the national uh, members of the of UEs and also international administration because we would really like to follow up uh, the um, way in which different member states are actually participating to the different calls uh, on technical assistance, I think uh, uh, regarding energy efficiency and to the flagship on renovation wave. I think that there are there is a little bit of a follow-up also to be done for us. And as we said in this very last panel, the connection between a good European Union legislation and um, a level of technical assistance which is able to reach the goal for which it was uh, uh, actually done. And in this sense, uh, Paola, we wish you all the luck um, in terms of the next uh, next legislation that the Commission is going to prepare. We do very much hope that uh, um, the minimum performance uh, uh, standards will be there, but we'll be talking, uh, I'm sure, about this again. Um, I want to thank you very much for having been here. Thank you to all the speakers. And as I said, we will be in contact and you will receive a, a short um, a short uh, report about the main conclusions and the main contributions to this event. Thank you and talk to you soon. Ciao, grazie. Thank you all. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye-bye.